Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, before I start today's presentation, I want to give a shout out to my brother, my little brother. Um, Christmas Day, he was almost dead. He was in the hospital up in Berkeley. Uh, almost died of kidney disease from a rare form of cancer, Burkitt, Burkitt's lymphoma, a rare aggressive cancer. I thought he was gone. I thought he was going to be gone. So here we are seven weeks later. The doctor says, uh, you got nothing. You got no cancer in you. He seems like he's beat the cancer. He played 18 rounds of golf yesterday, my little brother. Uh, the doctor can't believe it. My brother can't believe it. I can't believe it. My 82-year-old father can't believe it. Uh, he's gained 25 pounds. He's up from uh, 155 to 180. Uh, the doctor is going to continue giving him two more rounds of chemo as a precaution. He's going to take another test when the uh, two rounds of chemo are gone. I'll update you on it. I can't believe it. I mean, I thought my brother was going to be uh, really struggling uh, for his life. And uh, here he is playing golf. Uh, and there's absolutely no trace of cancer in him. No metabolic growth. It's not in his lymph. Uh, lymphatic area. I, mean, I don't know what's going on, and my brother doesn't know. He's just, he's taking it. I mean, this cancer is aggressive. It's rare. B u r k i t t s, Burkitt's lymphoma. So, I mention that because you know a lot of us were into watches, and let's just put our watch obsession in the correct. Uh, context, proportion. Let's not take ourselves too seriously. Having said that, now let's talk about the the <laughs> the agonies and the glories of the watch nibbler. That's what I want to talk about today. The watch nibbler is a guy, he spends about five hundred to a thousand dollars on a watch, you know, a mid-tier watch, and this is pretty much in the watch world considered shark bait. He doesn't eat the big shark, he doesn't feast on the big great shark because he doesn't want to delay his gratification and save up for that big feast of a shark. He just settles with a shark bait. And he does this in part because it's his comfort zone. He's comfortable with the mid-tier watch. You know, he doesn't freak out if he breaks the watch, loses the watch, scratches the watch, gets the watch stolen. There's no freak out and so he's comfortable. That's part of his appeal. That's part of the, the appeal of um, getting an, uh, a mid-tier watch. The other thing that he likes is he can be a member of the Watch of the Month Club. Every month or so, he can have a delivery to his house. And um, that's really nice. I mean, living in the suburbs, living a mundane existence, being bored, you know what you want. You want to be able to feel. You just want to feel something. And uh, actually, my favorite uh, songwriter, Father John Misty, has a song about this called uh, "Bored in the USA." Kind of a kind of a takeoff on uh, "Born in the USA" by uh, Bruce Springsteen. But you should listen to "Bored in the USA." So you know, you know, you're living in the suburbs, and you just want to feel. And you know, you get that package, and you get an adrenaline jolt. And you feel like a king. I mean, you've summoned a watch to your house. I mean, that's a nice sense of power for uh, for a dude whose main duty in life is uh, killing bugs for his daughters, or uh, you know, crawling under your desk to make sure the cable connections and your computer are all in in place. You know, ooh, higher purpose. So you know, you feel really special. And then your wife, she yells, "Honey, you got a package." And you, and you act all coy. You go, wow, a package for me? I wonder what it could be. Dude, you're so full of it. You know what it is. You've been on a FedEx website doing a, a tracking code five times a day. You've known its geographic coordinates every day for the last two weeks. Don't give me this. I wonder what it could be. So... You know, you love that adrenaline, you feel special, you feel like the king, you got your package, and now it's time for the unboxing. You'd like to do your unboxing on YouTube, and the unboxing's just, I mean, wow, man. I mean, you've got vanilla scented candles, and brute champagne, and Kenny G's playing, and you're salivating over the watch. 
and people uh, in the YouTube community are watching and they're commenting, dude, why don't you get a room? Why don't you turn off the lights? Why don't you have some private moments with your watch before you do this? Because this is a little too intimate for me. You know, and you, you just, you go through this very dramatic, uh, frankly, shameless, exaggerated uh, unboxing. Ooh, you know. And so you got that. Then, after the unboxing, you go through the honeymoon phase. This is the phase where you become the biggest fanboy for this watch. This, this honeymoon phase lasts about a month or two. You're a fanboy. You're preaching the watch. You're going, man, this watch, it answers all your problems. It checks every box, man. You're, you're banging your pecs like a silverback gorilla. I found it. I found the watch. And this goes on for maybe a month or two. And then after the honeymoon phase, you've got the, uh, the letdown phase. The letdown phase, the watch, suddenly it's not glowing anymore. That luster, that shimmering, undulating iridescence is gone. It's just this dull thing. You're ignoring it now in your watch box. You're not even putting it on. And it's looking up at you. Hey, remember me? I was your number one. And you just look down at the watch and you go, dude, I've moved on. Forget about it, kid. And you know, and now in the lockdown phase, you're you're on the internet and you're now perusing new watches, and because uh, you're going to get another package, you're going to be the king, and a new package is going to arrive. And so, um, a lot of us, you know, we we have some of the watch nibbler in in us. I have some of the watch nibbler in me. I can laugh at myself, and. and um, there's a general convention in the watch community that holds the watch nibbler in low esteem because the watch nibbler is undisciplined, childish, compulsive, wasteful. All that money uh, could be better spent on a higher uh, tier piece. And even the, the watch nibbler himself will agree with the assessment. He'll say to me, oh my God, my watch boxes are overloaded. They're like an abandoned foreclosed house with the weeds overgrowing. I can't manage this. Can't manage my life. I'm anxious. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost, bro. And I hate my life. So you get a lot of watch nibblers who reach that point. And they become disgusted. And they actually will just sell the whole thing and start over. They're just so disgusted. And um, I want to let you guys know that that is not the whole story of the watch nibbler. It's actually a very complicated story about the watch nibbler, which is uh, some watch nibblers tell me, hey man, I love what I do. Um, I'm not stressed out by the watches I'm getting. I have more content for my uh, channel. I have a, a diversity of watches, which is really fun for me. And because I have more content for my YouTube channel, I have more engagement with my YouTube subscribers. And honestly, I'm in this whole watch hobby thing to engage with people. It, the materialistic acquisition is uh, really not what it's all about for me. So I will defend my position. And you know what? That, that's, a, that's a very fair position. I totally buy that. Now, um, I don't think we can even look at the watch nibbler fully and accurately unless we put the watch nibbler in the context of the supposed opposite called the watch feaster. The person um, who doesn't get all these constant watches, rather gets one or two amazing high tier watches and that person is held in high esteem. But um, the watch feaster requires a good 10 minutes of description, just as I gave close to that amount of time for the watch uh, nibbler. So I won't be able to to go over the watch feaster right now, but I do want to let you guys know that I want to make the argument that the watch nibbler and the watch feaster are not so different. They actually have more similarities. And then I want to go on to say that some of us are neither the nibbler or the feaster were both. And if you're both, whoa, wow, man, which I probably have in me, then your watch obsession is in an acute uh, pathology mode for which there's probably no cure, but, but I'll probably elaborate on that uh, 
on my next video. I like to keep these videos around 10 minutes. Uh, it sounds about right. Uh, I'm going to call my brother again. We're just going to wallow in his good health. I mean, I don't want to jinx it, but right now, man, it sounds really good. I, mean, I, I want us to put our watch uh, obsessions in the context of uh, good health, you know. How you, you enjoying this? Your uh, SBDC125? You doing a watch ID for people? The, uh, the Steel Master looks pretty good, feeling pretty healthy. Yeah, I'm ready to sign off, man. I got This is my first day of class. Um, oh, I'll tell you one last thing before I go. Um, for the last 20 years, every day around 2 p.m., I will eat three medjool dates. Medjool dates are these big, juicy dates. They're the biggest Mercedes-Benz level dates of all the dates you can get out there. And, uh, you know, I struggle with my weight, as, we, as many of us do, and I just found out that three medjool dates is about 75 grams of sugar. That's more sugar than two cups of haagen vanilla ice cream. And I said, dude, I mean, no, you can't do that. So um, I'm off it. Today's my first day without medjool dates in 20 years. I don't think my metabolism can handle it. And um, so medjool dates, goodbye, man. Go goodbye, medjool dates. Uh, Thank you, my brother, and until next time, I'm out.